Hi, I'm Dr. Saifuddin, Hello. Dr. Amar. So we are going to discuss about the cranial nerve examination today. As you know, there are about 12 pairs of cranial nerves directly coming from the brain, and they're responsible for motor functions of the face, as well as the, the sensory supply, including the common sensations like the touch, temperature, and pain. In addition to that, certain special sensations like the hearing, the vision, the smell, and taste, and also the balancing. So there are, the, 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 each cranial nerve has got a specific function. So any abnormality can be detected by a detailed clinical examination and also a detailed history. But in the phases examination, which you are going to face, we may not allow you to take any detailed history in the neurological station. But if the patient is in the station two or her five long case, there you can take the history. Okay. Regarding the cranial nerves, and the first cranial nerve is the olfactory nerve, you all of you know, and that is responsible for the sensation of the smell and taste. In the PACES exam, we are not expecting you to do the olfactory nerve examination, but in a classical neurological examination, you have to test for the olfaction. So what you do usually, the, you, you ask the patient to close the eyes and then close one nostril and present, no, I'm closing your nostril, and so I'm just presenting a common order like a coffee. Okay, can you identify or not, you ask. Can you identify? Yes. Yes. Then repeat the test again with the, the, the next nostril, okay? Yes. This uh, in individual nostril testing with the sensation of the smell is being debated because when you are you asking the patient to smell through one nostril, the, this, smell, this sensation can be, the smell can be mixed up in the nasopharynx. So that's why we are not stressing you to do the olfaction. Now coming the second of the nerve is the optic nerve, which is responsible for the vision. When you are confronted with the optic nerve examination, there are five domains to be tested. One is the acuity of vision, second is the color vision, third is the peripheral field of vision, then afferent pupillary defect, and the fundus. So the acuity of vision, okay, if first before starting the testing the acuity of the vision, you should ask the patient whether are you wearing any uh, lenses for the refractive error. Do you have any lenses? No. no. So if the patient has a refractive error and he's using a lens, ask him to put on the lens and generally you start examining the acuity of vision and color vision. You should always carry a pocket lens chart which will carry all the colors as well as the letters for the acuity of vision. Usually in an examination like this, we are expected to be, carry this lens chart 14 inches away from you that you can ask the patient at a hand distance. This is about 14 inches. Then ask him to close one eye and ask him to read how many, say, you, can, you read, can you read from the top uh, lower bottom line? Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. you can come up. So that way you can assess the acuity of vision. Yes. At the same time, you ask him whether you can recognize the green and the red. Yes. Can you recognize? Yes. Yes. So you don't have any color vision, acquired color vision abnormality. If you have an acquired color vision abnormality, that gives an idea that the patient has an optic neuritis. Repeat the test with the other hand. Again, ask him to read the small letters and up, and also recognize the green and the red color. Yes. So after checking the acuity of vision, then next one is the peripheral field of vision. So you have to keep yourself between about four feet away between you two, and you are the, we are going to test the peripheral field of vision by the confrontation method. So the first was I expect you to do with the fingers. You tell him, give him an explanation. I am going to move my fingers on either side. So you, you identify the side and either show with your finger or you say the right or left. Okay, you go on looking at my nose. The left, the right, both. Okay, so by doing this, now we have excluded a homonymous semianopia as well as a visual attention. Now you ask him to close his left eye Okay, and I will close my right eye and I present three or four fingers in four quadrants, okay? How many fingers this one? Four. This one? Four. This one? Two. This one? Three. Okay, okay. Then can repeat the test with the other one. This one? Four. This one? Four. This one? Two. This one? One. Okay. All the four quadrants you have tested, the peripheral field is over. Now coming to the afferent pupillary defect. You have to have a dim light 
and then you ask him to look 15 meter away and then look at the pupillary reflex okay so both reflex we both pupils will be constricting even when you are throwing light on one eye the other pupil also will be constricting because of the consensual reaction now we can do the the, the fla swinging flash test okay you keep the uh, light for one or two seconds and come back to the other eye and every time when you are swinging the flashlight both pupils will be constricting whereas if they if one pupil is dilated or if they delay, delay the response it is called afferent pupillary defect and that gives an idea this patient has got a lesion anterior to the optic chiasma like optic neuritis or it could be a central artery retinal occlusion so that is over so you have tested the acuity of vision you have tested the color vision you have tested the peripheral field of vision you have tested the afferent pupillary defect and now we have to examine the fundus fundus you should carry your conventional ophthalmoscope you get into the pupil and then see the fundus the optic cup and then you follow the blood vessels to the periphery and also you look at the macula which is about one and a half this diameter is temporal to the disc okay so that is the second nerve the optic nerve now you are left with the third fourth and the sixth cranial nerves which are responsible for the eye movements so you just sit in front of the patient and observe over the eyes whether any evident abnormality in the eyelid or the palpebral fissure or the position of the eyes if the eye is deviated to some side that's called a squint the squinting eye so you should recognize now there are three you know third fourth and sixth cranial nerves are there if there is a third nerve palsy the eye will be deviated outward and outward and inferiorly and it will not adapt if the fourth nerve is paralyzed the eye will be deviated outward fixed outward and upwards in the resting position and when you try to adapt it will further go superiorly if there is a sixth nerve palsy the eye will be fixed medially uh, and then you cannot abduct so this is the way three curl cranial nerves will give an idea by observation and next after looking at that then you have to ask the patient to <coughs> you to look at the finger and then ask him to follow your your finger okay the tracking movement so ask him to follow this so you have looking now the lateral rectus or the sixth nerve and this is the superior rectus this is the inferior rectus and then come back here this is the medial rectus this is the inferior oblique this is the superior oblique and here come this is the superior rectus inferior rectus and here come this is the inferior oblique superior oblique so this is the h pattern of examination of the eye movements okay and then if you see a partial ptosis then you can ask the patient to uh, raise the uh, look upwards you ask him to look upwards and if the ptosis completely disappears it gives you an idea that is not due to a third nerve palsy or a neuromuscular junction or a muscle it can be a sympathetic fiber paralysis producing the horner syndrome so the third fourth sixth is over now we left with the fifth cranial nerve you know the fifth cranial nerve is responsible for the sensations of the face as well as the muscles of mastication supply the muscles of mastication so there are three branches the ophthalmic nerve the ophthalmic division the maxillary division and the mandibular division so you start testing ask him to close the eyes and then test the sen uh, touch sensation compare on either side by brushing a soft cotton wool this is the ophthalmic area this is the maxillary area and this is the mandibular area and at the same time you have to use a say a clean safety pin testing for the pain sensation ask him to close and again say ask him whether he can feel the pin okay or the maxillary area and the mandibular area okay and now you have to check check the muscles of mastication for that you have to palpate the masseter muscle on either side of the cheek okay and ask him to clench the teeth also the bulk and the tone of the muscle should be equal on either side now ask him to open the mouth and then look for the pterygoid muscle if there is a pterygoid palsy the the the, the jaw will deviate to the same side 
that is the fifth nerve and you are not supposed to do the corneal uh, reflex because it is harmful to the patient. Now comes to the seventh nerve. Seventh nerve, you know, it supplies all the facial muscles of expression as well as parasympathetic fibers to the lacrimal gland and the salivary gland. So three sets of muscles you can do. Ask him to grimace. Okay, that is for the frontalis. Then ask him to close your eyes tightly and try to open. That is the orbicularis oculi. Ask him to show your teeth for the rhizodius. And then ask him to puff out the cheek for the vaccinator. So these are the facial muscles. And then look at the conjunctiva and the tongue for the wet surface, which will give an idea of the lacrimation and salivation. So that's the seventh. Now comes the eighth nerve. There are two components of the eighth nerve. A cochlear branch, which is uh, responsible for the hearing, and the vestibular branch, which is responsible for the balancing. So the two components you have to test separately. Okay. So first you do the finger rub test. Ask him to close the eyes, and then whether you can hear this. Yes. You can hear this. Yes. You can hear this. Yes. Okay. So the rub test will identify the defective ear. If there are auditory symptoms, then you have to go ahead with the. Weber's test and the Rinse test. The Weber's test, you stuck a 256 or 552 with tuning fork. The stuck uh, base of the stuck tuning fork is kept over the head. Ask him, where do you hear the sound? Both, Both sides. So that is normal in a normal person, it's like that. Or if, if there is a conductive deafness, what will happen? The sound will be lateralized to the defective ear. Whereas in a sensory neural hearing defect, the sound will get lateralized to the normal ear. Now you have to do the rinse test. You ask him whether you can hear the vibrations yes. and then keep it behind the ear over the mastoid. Can you hear? Yes. Can you hear here now? Yes. Here? Yes. Which is better? The, the friend. Ear. Okay. So the air conduction is better than the bone conduction in a normal person as well as in a sensory neural hearing defect. But if there is a conductive deafness, then the bone conduction will be better. He will say, when you are keeping the tuning fork behind the ear, you are better hearing. Now comes the ninth and 10th. Ninth and 10th cranial nerves are the only one which are examined together. The ninth nerve is responsible for the supply, motor supply to the pharynx and also sensations to the posterior half of the tongue, the pharynx, and also it helps in swallowing and is the afferent limb of the gag reflex. The tenth carries a lot of autonomic fibers which carry, supply the heart and the gut and also acids in swallowing and also it is more to supply to the vocal cord, uh, the vocal cord musculature and also sensory supply to the larynx and pharynx. Okay, and also it's the efferent limb of the gag reflex. So you ask him to open the uh, mouth and ask him to say ah, ah, ah. So both palate with the palatal arch will rise symmetrically. If there is a ninth and tenth palsy on one side, that part of the palatal arch will not rise, it will droop down, and that gives you an idea that there is a ninth and tenth palsy on, the, on that side. At the same time, if the patient has got a hoarseness, that gives you a further clue that the recurrent laryngeal nerve which is a branch of the vagal nerve is affected, so the vocal cord is not uh, functioning. That's why we have the hoarseness of voice. Now comes the 11th nerve, the spinal accessory nerve, is responsible for the movement of the, uh, the head and neck and the shoulder. There are two muscles to be tested. One is the sternocleidomastoid muscle, and for that, you ask the patient to, uh, uh, you, uh, you move your chin towards the left and ask him to bring back to the midline this is for the sternocleidomastoid, the opposite one, and do the same thing this side. And okay, so, so the sternocleidomastoid is responsible for the movement of the chin to the opposite side. Now, coming to the, uh, the, uh, the stapesius part of the accessory nerve, you we'll ask him to shrug the shoulder towards the ear, okay, and then here, and here, okay. So that is the 11th nerve. Now, the 12th nerve is concerned with the all the muscles of the tongue. So ask him to stick out the tongue and look for an ah. Uh, okay, look out the tongue and then look for any fasciculations or wasting. And ask him to move to either side. Yes, that's good. Only one caution, if a patient has got a uh, lower motor neuron, upper motor neuron, facial palsy on one side, when you ask him to put out the tongue, 
it will have a mild deviation to that paralyzed side that because of the loss of proprioceptive sensations. In that case, to confirm that the 12th nerve is intact, ask him to push your hand. Yes, you push the hand with the tongue on either side. That gives you an idea the tongue, the 12th nerve is not involved. And I forgot to mention you, when the 7th nerve palsy, in a lower motor neuron for palsy, the whole half of the face will be affected, whereas in upper motor neuron palsy, only the lower half of the face will be affected. So we have finished the cranial nerve examination. Do you have any doubts, Amma? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, yeah. How do we differentiate between unioocular diplopia and binocular diplopia? Okay. So if the patient complains of diplopia, that means that the, 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 uh, the mo eye movements are not proper, so that uh, the, some of the eye muscles are weak. That's why they, he is getting a diplopia. So it can be either binocular diplopia or unioocular diplopia. So we ask to close one eye, and if the diplopia disappears, it's a binocular diplopia. So it can be due to either the cranial nerve or the muscle in, in, involvement. Suppose if it is persisting in spite of the closing the eye, it's called a monoocular diplopia. It can be either due to a corneal abnormality like keratoconus, or it can be a lens abnormality like the cataract, or it can be due to a foveal traction. These are the causes of the uniocular or the monoocular diplopia. And sir, uh, you mentioned that we would have, like, if there is any obvious squint hmm. or strabismus, we would have to note it. Yeah. So how do we differentiate between a congenital strabismus and a parallel yeah. one? That's a very good question. So you can get a patient with a congenital squint uh, either in the neurology station or in the 2 or a 5 station. So your task is to find out whether it is a congenital squint or a parallel squint. Five points you have to remember. Congenital squint from, occurs from the child, since childhood. So you can get elicit the history whether this uh, eye, the, eye, the, the squinting is from the childhood or not. That is one. Second, you, the, 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 in, the patient will never complain of diplopia. So you can ask in the history whether you have any double vision. Third one, if you check the individual eye movements, it will be full. All the third, the superior rectus, inferior rectus, medial rectus, all the eye movements will be full. And the fourth one, the 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 uh, the Patient will have an amblyopia in the squinting eye because this is from childhood, the visual axes are not parallel, so the images are not fusing in the occipital cortex. So the, the, the brain is trying to mask that by decreasing the vision in the eye. That's why the patient developed the amblyopia. And the fifth one is the primary deviation and the secondary deviation. That how do you look? You look at the patient and you identify the squinting eye and then you ask him to close the apparently normal eye before asking you to fix the, first you ask him to fix the object on your finger and then the apparently normal eye you ask him to close. Then what will happen, the squinting eye will move to fix the object. That's called the primary deviation. Then you ask him to take out the hand, then this normal eye will also move in the same direction as the squinting eye to fix the object that is called the secondary deviation. Primary and secondary deviation are equal in a congenital squint, whether the secondary deviation will be more than the primary in a paralytic squint. Okay. Any other questions? No, okay, thank you. thank you very much.